Okay. Sorry. Trouble already.
Good evening, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, first and foremost, uh, going over the traffic issues, uh, we've had a number of concerns and complaints over traffic related issues, uh, particularly on Castle Pines Parkway, as well as Monarch Boulevard. Um, as a result, last week, uh, we put variable message boards up on Castle Pines Parkway. We did a social networking uh, uh, campaign to put the message out to the media that there are, our officers would be out there doing feed, speed enforcement on Castle Pines Parkway. We have had some good responses uh, to that. Um, our deputies have been out throughout the entire weekend. They have been writing some tickets, uh, but more importantly, they have uh, had a vigil presence not only with people that are just passing through Castle Pines, but also with the residents. Um, and even took the opportunity to talk to one of the residents while they were running radar on the side of the street, kind of showed them what they were doing. And it was good to have that interaction with the citizen and the community just to let them know why we're out there and what we're doing. Um, in regards to that, uh, just to add to that, the, uh, there have been some particular concerns with motorcycles uh, trying to bypass Castle Rock because of the traffic mess, mess of Castle Rock so they can get to Sedalia. So as a result, they were cutting through Castle Pines, cutting down through Daniels Park Road. So our officers have that in mind. Um, so hopefully um, uh, people are obeying the, the speed limits, but uh, we're gonna continue that through the entire summer uh, months um, until Castle Rock, uh, their traffic problem is alleviated because it's pretty clear they're, they're cutting through there and going uh, uh, that direction. Uh, we did put a, stat, a stealth stat survey um, over on Castle Pines Parkway uh, just west of Timber Trail Elementary. Now what this is, is a box for us to count vehicle speeds um, through that area. So there's no uh, um, cable that's put on the ground or anything like that. It's, it's just a box and it reads both eastbound and westbound traffic. Um, we took that box was put out there um, on Thursday morning at about 11.30 and it was taken off sometime about, about Monday. Just to give you an idea, and this includes both eastbound and westbound traffic, 14,920 vehicles passed both eastbound and westbound through that area. It's a lot of traffic. Uh, the good news is, is that the majority of traffic going through that area was traveling at 36 miles per hour, so they're actually getting 4 miles an hour under the speed limit. However, the uh, top speed reached was 65 miles per hour. So, um, obviously we're gonna continue enforcement uh, efforts in that area. I wanted to let you know that the stealth stop meter is gonna be put in the area of Yorkshire and Castle Pines to get another measure of speed, uh, because I do think that we have a lot more people coming in uh, at higher speeds, and when they get up that hill, they're kind of slowing down. So, um, we're gonna get a meter uh, over there. The variable message board is going to be moved from Castle Pines Parkway to Monarch Boulevard so we can get people's attention on that side as well. So um, I just want to assure you that we take traffic uh, issues very seriously. Um, we're proud to be part of the uh, uh, Castle Pines and uh, we're going to do what we need to do to ensure that the uh, citizens are safe out there. Um, just a quick question. Yes, sir. Uh, the 14,000 cars, was that over the four day period or was that an average per day? Uh, no, that was over the four-day period. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Um, as uh, we're getting into the summer months, our deputies will be patrolling the uh, park areas after our hours, uh, ensuring that the people are out of the parks and the parks closed. I know last year we had a lot of vandalism with the trees as well as the playground equipment, so our deputies will be out there in contact with people um, after hours. Uh, there is a new park or a parking area that's opened up. It's actually just outside the city limits. I believe that's owned by the city and county of Denver. We are having issues with kids and people parking there after hours. So we're gonna get some signage up there, uh, working on that with the county and the city of Denver just to uh, eliminate that issue because although it's out of the side of the city, city limits, it does affect the city. Um, just wanna remind people that uh, uh, as I looked through the stats in pre preparation for this meeting, I didn't see any alarming stats or calls for service uh, to bring to the attention of the council, but I do re wanna remind people that if you go to the Sheriff's Office website, on the right-hand side, you'll see neighborhood crime. Just click on that link and you're able to um, look at uh, calls for service in the city of Castle Pines. Every 99% uh, uh, of the calls that we go to are out there. The only thing we don't put out there is stuff that we legally or can't put out there. So people can look and see what's going on in their, in their neighborhoods. Um, as always, I welcome everybody to contact me at any time. I leave cards in the back. If anybody has any questions, concerns, any citizens uh, with any questions or concerns, please contact me and you can be reassured I will get back with you as soon as possible. That's all I've got. Uh, one question. Um, are all the speeding tickets you issued, 
What's, what's the trend on miles over 40? We allow our deputies to use discretion. Um, we don't mandate tickets. We don't have a ticket quota or anything like that. So it depends on how fast they are going, uh, attitude of the driver. Um, there's a lot of variables that go into it. I will tell you that most of our deputies will write tickets uh, anywhere from 11 miles an hour and above. Uh, typically, they will definitely be riding people at 15 over, but um, you could get pulled over as little as, as you know, it depends on the deputy, uh, but you know, eight to nine, 10 miles an hour over, uh, but you're probably looking at a ticket closer to 11, 12, 13, and anything above that. So, but there's a lot of variables that do go into that. I, I just wanna, Thank you. I actually had a, uh, a, a couple of friends of mine who are constituents as well complaining about getting pulled over. Each of them got a ticket <laughs> right. in the last couple of weeks. So it's you're, you're certainly doing a better, I don't want to say a better job, uh, right. you're, you're certainly enforcing at this point in time and they ask, me to, ask it to be stopped and I was like, there's no way. Right. Right. There, there is a there is a balance there because we on one hand we have people saying that we're not doing enough enforcement and we have the other hand saying we're doing too much enforcement so we try to find a balance uh, in between there so um, but hopefully and I don't mind uh, I don't mind saying this is, is if Castle Pines frankly has a reputation that you better obey the traffic laws in Castle Pines you're probably going to get pulled over I'm okay with that and hopefully people will just you know if you don't break the law you don't get pulled over that's the bottom line. And just to be clear, I, I support that. Okay. <laughs> I'm asking you to do anything different. So thank you. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Captain. Thank you. thank you. I also want to add my thanks and say I had a neighbor constituent also know your your visibility. She didn't get pulled over. She was actually running in the neighborhood. She said, what is going on? They're everywhere. And I said, yes, they are. Yeah. That's good to hear. <laughs> um, I had a couple quick questions for you. One is... Um, what happened up there on that, that took out our lovely crossing signal light and our light pole at the top of Monarch? Um, that one I did not hear about, so uh, I will look into that and report back to you. Okay, because obviously that kind of supports the our um, stipulation that people are really uh, traveling through at a high rate of speed. That was some point Friday night, early Saturday morning. Okay. Um, and then the other question that I have, when we are, what kind of brought up this whole topic was the concern for our citizens and uh, our pedestrians that are trying to cross on our lighted crosswalks. And I know that um, I appreciate the enforcement, but I have seen, and I, I guess it's a universal thing that happens in spring that people are distracted or whatever. I have seen a lot of people blowing through the crosswalks even when the lights are on. Right. Um, and I happen to be sitting downtown Parker and they have the same thing going on. So is there any kind of, um, I know you said you kind of had a social media program going on, but is there any kind of program that goes on at the county level or, or can there be one? Kind of like how you guys have Stay Alive at 55 or whatever your little campaigns that you create for that. Since it seems to be a consistent thing throughout your jurisdictions within Douglas County, is there kind of a greater, um, consciousness or a greater campaign or effort that could be taking place. I know that we had already engaged our communications firm to try to get more citizen involvement and kind of help get a citizen-led uh, initiative to this, but since I've observed it in other municipalities, I'm wondering if there's been any discussion in the Sheriff's Office about kind of taking a greater, a, a broader, more holistic look. We have, we, I don't know if you've noticed, the State Patrol with their new campaign, Get Your Head Out of Your Apps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will tell you that, um, um, you know, and for anybody that, that might be listening or watching this, um, it, it's very critical that if you're running or you're walking or anything, don't assume people are going to stop for you. Um, because, um, you know, when I was a young deputy working the street, um, it was easy to find drunk drivers because people would be weaving all over the road, crossing the line, and everything else. Uh, nowadays, it's people looking at their phone and not paying attention to the road. And it's it's very easy that the people are looking down at their phone, somebody's trying to run across the street, and we're going to have a tragedy. Um, so I, I will talk to our community relations people. I think it's long overdue for us to, to, to maybe get on board with something to that effect. Um, right now, we don't have any particular campaigns like that, but um, I think it's critical and important that people need to start paying attention. And I also am hopeful that these, these traffic efforts that we will continue uh, will help, hopefully uh, get people to pay more attention to what they're doing behind the wheel. Thank you so much, Kevin. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Nickel. I'm Jim. My dad is Mr. Nickel. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, Mayor.
Mayor Pro Tem and the Council. Uh, let me apologize first off. When Don first contacted me, I swore he said I had three hours tonight and he had three minutes. So I'll, I'll try to shorten this up a little bit. But, uh, in front of you, I passed out earlier a set of maps and uh, I'll give you a little background on these. These were compiled by our consultant, Kennedy Jakes. And what they did was they poured over plat maps and used those plat maps to determine where facilities were at and the ownership of those facilities, therefore the responsibility for maintenance. And so what you see in front of you on that first page is a series of little blobs, and those are ponds. Those are stormwater ponds in this area. And these ponds are typically retention ponds to slow water down. The thing that's kind of interesting here is while the big yellow blobs belong to the district, the majority of the blobs actually belong to the HOAs. As you move on through these maps, in the next page, you will see uh, an ownership uh, breakdown. And what carries over through here is once again, while the district has a number of facilities in the area, and we cover a lot of area with our facilities because we end up maintaining all these major drainage ways. But when you look at the detention ponds, when you look at the soils and channels, the structures, and then the amount of pipe that's in the ground to convey storm water, what you see once again is how much of this stormwater system is actually owned by the HOAs. The uh, balance of the pages then as you move on through it, I think there's probably a duplication on this, this particular chart and you have received two of these pages. But then what you get into is a series of blow-up maps and there's a key so that you can tell where you are in the area that's highlighted. And what we did here was to show ponds, structures, pipe, conveyance systems, and once again, who owns these systems. About this point in time, as your eyes start to glaze over, because frankly, stormwater is not a real sexy topic, it ranks right up there with water and wastewater. And you might be asking the question, why is this important? And the reason this is important is both the city and the district are MS4 permit holders. And that's as technical as I'll get tonight. But what MS4 basically is municipal separate storm sewer systems. If you're from back east or if you're spending time back east, most of the older systems back there are combined systems. Stormwater and wastewater both flow together and flow to a treatment plant. Out west here, and being newer systems, we don't do that. Our wastewater, our sanitary sewer all runs down to the Plum Creek plant. Our stormwater runoff all continues on as surface water and ends up in our waterways continues on out and becomes part of our rivers and in many cases becomes part of our drinking water. So we're both MS4 permit holders. We're a little bit different though. Uh, the district is a non-standing permit holder and therefore we defer to the city on uh, things like construction site stormwater management, runoff control, post-construction stormwater management, and just illicit discharge detection and elimination. Now, both the city and the district have maintenance programs in place, and we both have our responsibilities and requirements under our permits. But we, what we find, or what we believe we find, is that the HOAs and their management companies and their boards really have no idea what they're responsible for, uh, the maintenance that they should be doing, and particularly things like spill programs. I think that become very evident, at least to our district, in July when we had a very large storm event over a two-day period uh, where we suffered damage, but there was also damage within many of the HOAs along the golf course, and the calls for the next couple of weeks that were coming into us uh, were astounding, and in almost all cases we had to let people know that that was not our responsibility and that falls back to the HOA. So I also placed in front of you a couple of pictures tonight. This is what we refer to as Pond 12. And if you look at the front page, Pond 12 
is a large yellow blob that sits towards the right hand side of the drum, just about in the middle of the community, for your reference, right there. And if you know the topography of this area, everything, uh, probably about 90% of this area drains towards that point. Uh, that channel is actually known as Happy Canyon, and the structure that you see in the pictures is damage that we suffered both in the September 13th storm event, and then again in July of uh, 2014. Between September and July, uh, we'd had crews actually go in. And what you don't see is on the top of the structure and behind it, there were some holes that actually opened up in the water trying to run over the structure. We had such a large volume of water that it simply couldn't pass through all those pipes. It started to build up and overtop the structure. We actually had crews come in with flow fill, which is a very low strength concrete, uh, to try to support the structure. In the July storms, it actually washed all that material back out again. So we've determined that we need to come in and do something with this structure. We're still not for sure yet. It's under design. Uh, I have two firms working on it, Kennedy James and Mueller Engineering. But we know that we're faced with about um, half a million dollars worth of improvements or repairs just on this structure alone. So you get the sense that maintenance of these items can be very costly, and it's, it's also a concern when it comes to the HOAs. So part of what we're working with, um, with Kennedy Jenks and Mueller in the repair of this structure, uh, we've contacted Urban Drainage, and we've yeah. also so you're saying that it's a half a million dollars just for this thing? Just to repair thing. that. Okay. That's, and that's one structure here in this community. We're working with uh, urban drainage in Douglas County to determine how to best proceed with these repairs. And the, the reason for that is there's actually a master map plan that's been developed on Happy uh, Canyon. And it runs basically from the confluence of Happy Canyon Cherry Creek, all the way to Cherry Creek, the creek, not the reservoir, all the way back upstream through this community. It involves Arapahoe County, Douglas County, and a number of other entities along that route. And those folks are all looking at improvements along that channel to help with the head cutting and the erosion that we see. And it's one of the things in those pictures, if you look at the one that's kind of looking upstream towards the structure, you see huge amounts of erosion that have taken place. That erosion didn't all happen over those two storm events. It's happened over time. And so along this entire waterway, there are improvements that need to be made. Uh, what we hope to determine over time is, do we, as a district, spend half a million dollars improving this structure and doing what we can within the waterway? Or do those funds become part of a larger improvement along the creek? That, that, that's also a possibility. One of the issues we face, though, is when you bring in urban drainage, their current standards are so high that it's not always affordable for a community of our size to make the improvements as they would like to see them. So we have a commitment to replace or repair the structure as it exists today. If those dollars are better spent with other improvements along the waterway, we're happy to do that. But at a half a million dollars, that was a big shock to us. Uh, our, uh, our annual budgets for 2013 and 2014 in, in stormwater were $91,000 and $72,000, uh, respectively, for those two years. And so to come up with a half a million dollars for this repair this year, what we've done is drawn down reserves, instituted a $30 per single family equivalent fee. We split that out, as most of you are aware now, over a three month period. So everybody's kicking in $30, larger water tap sizes and, and commercial areas tap have actually contributed more than that. That's how we arrived at uh, half a million dollars in fees or in funding for this year. We've also increased our stormwater fee from $4 per SFE per month to $5 per SFE. That helps a little bit this year, but 
more importantly, it will help us build those reserves back up and help us have that rainy day fund in the event we have another occurrence like this. And so we we're faced with both aging infrastructure as well as, and I don't like the word climate change, but we're seeing changes. Uh, these two storm events in two years are very abnormal for this area, and these systems just simply cannot handle that type of rainfall. Just a, uh, Jim, a question. You're talking about urban drainage. You're talking about a, a master plan for improvements all, all the way up and down the channel. Um, looking at the map, is the district's responsibility or financial responsibility for only that section uh, from uh, outlet of number 12 to the city limits? Is that the end of your responsibility as a total? That's correct, Doug. Thank you. So just to clarify to make sure that I understand your terminology. Um, <clears throat> so you said we have a commitment to repair. Does that mean the board has voted on that that's, that that's, needs to be repaired? That's, our, that's in our okay. budget. Okay. okay. And um, then you said this basically the fees, the split fee and the increased stormwater fee is to pay for this or to you pull the money from reserves and this is replenishing the money in reserve? No, it's a combination. In order to, to be able to budget 500000 for this repair for this year, it was a combination of pulling money from reserves, the money that's typically uh, allocated within the stormwater enterprise fund, along with the money being collected over the three-month period. So those, those funds in total come up to the $500,000. So next year we start off with no reserves and we start building the fund once again and collecting our monthly fee at $5 per SFE per this year's approved budget and fees. Are there any grants available or anything, Jim, from CDPHE or other you know, we, things that might help? We looked in that right after the both flooding events and all the grant money is, has gone up north where they got hit even harder. Uh, that's one of the first questions we asked is, what can you do to help us? And they basically said, get in line, and by the way, we're out of money. So. And Jim, just to clarify, um, so you have, you took the money out of the reserves, you instituted a $30 fee per household, which is $10 per month for three months. Correct. And then you had, you increased the stormwater fee from $4 to $5. That's correct. So is the $4 to $5 increase part of the $500,000 throughout this year? It is. Okay, then, so, in your fiscal year is calendar year, right? That is correct. So come January 1, that $1 fee increase will start replenishing reserves. That is correct. Got it. Along with the $4 that was already instituted. Oh, that so, already goes into the reserves already? Well, it, it went into that enterprise fund. With, in, with, yeah. with your $90,000 budget or whatever it is pre -year. That's right, but what we've done is drawn reserves down to basically zero. And what would your, what did your budget this year for I obviously take the five hundred thousand dollars out. Uh, five hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so the five hundred ninety, or the just five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. Oh, just straight. We've we've got enough to make this repair, and that's okay. Kept. Got it. And, and and so, how are you going to cover the other potentially seventy-five to ninety thousand um, dollars? Good question. Good, good luck. In good luck. Well, <laughs> probably a little less cleanup and a little bit less maintenance on other items this year. Okay. That's, only have so many dollars to go yeah, around. You got, you got to prioritize on that. That's, that's right. And this, this structure is important because if, if, if the trail that crosses over the top of it, if we were to lose that and we lose the pond, another storm event comes along, there's increased flooding that goes along with that, it's, it needs to be taken care of. And so when, when do you expect those repairs to be done? Um, I would suspect that we will come out of design uh, probably late July bid in August and start this work in September then. And there's probably 60 to 90 days worth of work in there, depending on whether the entire structure is taken out and rebuilt, or if somebody comes up with some ideas on how to stabilize the area that's underneath and behind this. Uh, you can actually get up on top and look down and see those corrugated steel pipes. Uh, as the material washed over this structure, it, it found a little path, and once water starts to eat away at things, it just continues to eat, and that's what happened in, in this case. So this structure looks, it actually 
actually leans a little bit in one direction right now, so it has no support under it. And we'll, uh, we'll, let, we'll let my good engineers figure that out. I, I do everything but structures. So maybe one of the takeaways tonight is that these same types of events and damage to structures can happen to the HOAs. Sorry, Jim, just one back to that. How long do you, do you think it'll take the builders to back up? At uh, current monthly rates, here's the build the reserves. $5 per household, or for, let's say $5 per single family tap is $60 a year, and we service about 3,300 single family equivalents. So 3,300 times $60 doesn't go a long ways toward the building reserves. And paying for operating. And, and paying for maintenance on top of that. So knowing that the same type of thing can happen to the HOAs and assuming Knowing back last July how little information that was out in the hands of the HOAs and their management as to what their responsibilities are. Uh, Brad and I, about a year ago, tried to energize this community and ran into a little bit of a brick wall. But I'm here again tonight, or as part of tonight, to suggest that it's once again time for the city and the district to attempt to work together you have very good staff. I'm volunteering my time. And I'd like to see if there isn't a way that we can reach out to the management companies and the HOA, whether it be in an open house or some sort of educational forum, or if we have to go door to door and buy people cups of coffee. You know. But we need to get the message out to these folks what the responsibilities are. We have the resources to handle a half a million dollars in if that had occurred to any one of the HOAs, we seriously doubt that they would have that type of funding available. And now you've got the same types of problems that we face if we don't make those repairs. These things tend to time kind of snowball on you. So I guess in wrap up tonight, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to take those. But I would hope council might provide staff some direction to allow us to once again, we start to work together and figure out how best to get this information out into the hands of the HOAs and their, their management teams. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and that, thanks for addressing that, because that was one of the questions that I wrote down. I was like, I, I don't think my HOA <coughs> probably knows what their role is or what their responsibility is. So. You, you know, stormwater is one of those things that until we have a flood, nobody thinks about. Water's a little different because if you turn on the faucet and it doesn't come out, you, you know immediately something's wrong. You flush the toilet, it doesn't go away, you know something's wrong. But stormwater, these systems just sit out there and we've got a beautiful green belt, the water runs through it, and I'd say 99% of the people never think about the fact that that's there for a reason. That's to convey all the storm runoff when we get these big events. Hey, Jim. Um, just one quick question, being a Forest Park person. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, you own a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I'm I, I love the fact that I'm, I'm, I think I'm the winner of the lottery. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that actually was my question. I see they're all red. So none of the reten re um, retention ponds, storm ponds uh, in Forest Park were on the golf course, because some of them appear to be on the golf course. Those are all Forest Park responsibility, not the ridge? That, that's correct. As, as we've looked at the plats, those fall to your responsibility. Okay. I think I, I, I can now. I, I think that that would be a surprise to some of the people in the Forest Park HOA. Maybe probably, not anymore, but it would have been a while ago. And I see Brad shaking his head at me. <laughs> Cindy Brockmeyer knows. She does know now? She does know. And if you flip towards the back, use the little key, you'll be able to see exactly the blow-up sections. Want all yours? Congratulations, you're a winner. <laughs> Thanks. Jim, I'd just like to thank you. Um, can 
Andy Jenks and everybody who put this together. Um, it's a wonderful document. Obviously, it's going to take uh, some time to, to look and digest it. I just kind of did the count. 20 different colors, 20 different ownerships. Um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'll, I'll say that I believe council will support the effort of the city and the district to work together to educate these folks, especially looking at the number that we have here. And if council's in agreement with that, I think we'll get the two entities together. Um, Jim, I don't know if your uh, communications firm uh, has any ideas, and if uh, Sleek Communications or ours might have some ideas that maybe we can get everybody together and start brainstorming. I, I think that's a great idea. We're actually between communications firms right now, but hopefully in the next 30 days I'll have somebody back on board again. Uh, and yeah, to me, partly it's what's the best way to reach out to this group? Say it, it, it may be you know, we do an open house and put up some posters. I'll tell you, your consultant and Brad have already developed some very good information. We have a lot of stuff that's ready to go. We just need an audience to get it out to. And right now, that's been the difficult part is getting that audience and getting them in here. So, okay. Very good. A question. On the, uh, the new property that is involved along the game Road, is that all going to become city responsibility? I can tell you it's not becoming district responsibility.
since a big part of our budget is the roads, and more roads, um, I've noticed, especially with this between the castle, rough nightmare they're doing down there, and also over on Santa Fe. So if you'd like to take the back way to Lowe's. So it's really congested, and there's a ton of massive trucks. And they're taking Castle Pines Parkway and the shortcut to Santa Fe. Now, I've inadvertently followed in the past just regular trucks. That's a, that's a shortcut. Um, do we know is, I don't, well, okay, on Hess Road, I saw a sign somewhere that said truck route. Is Castle Pines Parkway a truck route? Not a sign truck route, but I imagine all the truckers have know where to go and how to get around traffic jam, so I would probably suspect it's an unofficial trucker's truck route. It's not an official sign one that we have. I mean, is that like a county thing? I mean, the, the traffic is massive. It's not helping our, our roads, and this is becoming a well-known shortcut. Is there anything that we can look into? Or? Really, there's only two options, and I'm sure the attorney will probably be kicking me under the table. But really, the two solutions I've ever seen when it comes to big trucks have to do with weight loads and size. And if there's restrictions on those, then you have an enforcement mechanism. If there's no such ordinance in place that regulates those sort of things, then it's uh, traffic or trucks have uh, the right to travel our streets. Can I follow up on that? No, I, I mean, that's, I just whispered to Don that, you know, there, we could impose weight limits and size limits, but I. It's a question of enforcement then, and I'm not sure that we have the resources to enforce that through the uh, Douglas County Sheriff's Department. Or retractable spikes, please. That would be effective. So, is there really any? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Is, I think that's a very valid concern because I know that that's something that has been a concern of mine in the past. It's the same deal with Monarch. There, you know, if there gets to be any kind of um, a traffic accident or whatever that backs up I-25, they all cut through Monarch and down our roads. And I think it's a very valid concern because, you know, we have to maintain these roads. So um, if enforcement is the only concern, I mean, are there other options? For, for example, the, the sign that we're currently using for, you know, speeds is, to, is there signage that we can put up that this is not a truck route or not a truck route or, you know, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm just wondering if there are other options. I mean, we can look at putting up signs. I mean, however, if there isn't any teeth behind those signs, all we're doing is telling people they shouldn't do it if they choose to do it. We have an enforcement mechanism that tells them that they're oversized or overweight, we can put them and say, not a truck route, please go away, do something else, but that's all it is, it's a sign. And, and I know you're gonna love hearing this, Don and Brad, but that's one of the things that I've been wondering about, and that's why I like the ideas of putting a few more roundabouts on Castle Pines Parkway, because that's the kind of thing that's gonna stop the big trucks coming through. Now, I know there's some issues with doing that, not the least of what's being cost, um, but you know, the, the fact is that because we don't have the ability to enforce, we have to make it so they don't want to come through if we're gonna go through. So the, the, the road spikes, while humorous, um, it, the, the, the concept is the same, is that you don't wanna go through, right? And so if you have more roundabouts, they're not gonna come through. And um, I, I get the impression that not just the trucks for the construction, but you have a lot of people coming through from Parker Road all the way over to uh, Santa Fe, they use it as a cut through. Um, you see Happy Canyon, they put in roundabouts, and I bet the reason they put the roundabouts in for the village was to keep cars from using it as a pass through. So I, I don't know how we make that happen here. Um, and I've had a number of conversations with staff about it. It's not an easy thing for us to accomplish, but it seems to me that that's one solution, and that's a long term solution, not, not something we can do today. No, I, I agree. I agree with you. In fact, I had a conversation a year ago with Don and Brad on uh, being fortunate to live right in the corner of the parkway. 
I can tell you that from about 5.30 to 6.30 every morning, there is a high volume of heavy trucks that are coming through, going both ways. And uh, one of the problems in the morning is that uh, they come rolling down, get to the hill, and they're going to turn on if they're using the jig break. And so all of a sudden we're listening to this rumbling noise. And uh, you know, if you guys want to get up early some morning, you're welcome to. <laughs> yeah, I'll find a place on it. But it is a real problem. And uh, I think to the extent we do nothing to address it at all, we just want to further getting people to go through. But, uh, I guess my question really is, does are there any restrictions that we might put on that would impair our ability to get uh, federal monies or highway monies, whatever we get? Uh, many new municipalities throughout the state of Colorado, and I suggest across the United States, have weight limits or length limits, load limits uh, imposed upon streets. Um, those are certainly an option. Uh, as far as the jake breaks, uh, a simple adoption of the so-called no jake break ordinance, um, you know, that can be easily implemented. Again, it's an enforcement issue. You've got to be around when that happens. Uh, the low-cost uh, effective solution is to look into the idea of weight or axle limit loads. That's the simplest solution. There's a lot of variables. You have to make exemptions for local deliveries, things like that. I've seen those before. It is certainly doable. It's a fairly inexpensive option. Um, if council wants to go that direction, we certainly can research it, look at it, and if council wants to adopt it, we can, with the knowledge that there has to be, uh, if you may, a grace period for enforcement where it's just uh, information to trucking companies, stopping those on our streets and letting them know those rules are in effect until we put the hammer down on those guys. Wouldn't the enforcement be fairly, I don't want to say easy, but we know the time they come through, right? So that should be helpful for, for the enforcement side. Yeah, especially if we have that knowledge of the time and when they're coming through, yes, we can become more cognizant and aware of uh, those particular times. Another one to look at is, you know, once we get maybe the Happy Canyon connection a few years down the road, again, long-term solutions, we make some of the improvements. Uh, we look at the north-south connection between uh, Hess Road and uh, Crow Foot. Uh, you know, that might become another side of the issue where they go there. So there's a lot of long-term things that may come into play, but the short-term solution would be weight and length limit loads. So um, what I'm hearing is that it's definitely a, a concern of, it seems to be the majority of council. So to accept it as a foregone conclusion that there isn't anything that can be done about it is um, not, not the consensus. I think what I'd like to see is, um, you know, staff to come back with us about some, from some different options on how we might be able to mitigate this issue because it, it's a concern of um, all the elected officials. We'll, we'll take a look at the enforcement side of it uh, from the regards of uh, weight and size limitations. So there's two easiest ones, low cost ones to take, and so we'll work on that. And it, you know, it may get into traffic code or whatever, but if we also, if we, we know what time in the morning that this is happening, and um, it's not coinciding with the traffic that we're trying to get out of the city, if they're coming this way, maybe there's a way that we can make it less attractive because they're gonna have to sit at our lights uh, a lot longer to not make it worth their time. I mean, maybe there, I'm just suggesting there may be other um, ways to deter, you know, discourage the behavior that we don't want. And another, it won't be a solution, but another option is to, uh, is this for Castle Rock development? Is that for the project that they're doing? It's along Santa Fe. Yes, is it in Castle Rock? Right? They're, they're avoiding the construction on Santa Fe because Santa Fe is down their, the, the flight that they're doing. It, 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 the, I think the trucks, the trucks are actually part of the, the meadows. The, 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 I think the issue is that the bridge going over Santa Fe, uh -huh. um, these trucks are part of that project. 
I think. Okay. I don't know for sure, but I think that's part of what's going so on. So we could reach out to Castle Rock and say, did you implement or require a truck route for these new developments? And if not, let's try to work together to come up with a different truck route that they'd be required to follow that doesn't impact neighborhoods. A lot of that traffic, excuse me, uh, goes through, uh, it goes all the way across Taft. There's a tremendous amount of development going on to the east of I-25 between Lincoln and Hess Road. And I do know for a fact, having got up early one morning and uh, sat down at the little park at the end of the parkway of that traffic coming through and watching all of on my own and just goes right, right straight on through. Just sitting here scratching my head, trying to figure out how to be uh, helpful. Not much came up, but let me ask you a couple of questions. Uh, one thing when we were off looking at the pavement index, uh, we learned that our roads had different thicknesses of pavement, and that was designed for longevity and whatnot. So that does argue for weight restrictions um, very much in keeping with how the road was designed. Uh, on the other hand, if you really want to get somebody's attention, can you impose a toll? Mr. 
Um, we will be having a public hearing on uh, April 14th for the Century Lake Franchise Agreement. So that'll be for y'all, before us all on the 14th. Otherwise, um, I don't have anything else today. Thank you. Four, two, one, three, three. Uh, just one thing. Some time ago, maybe last August or so, one of the uh, meetings, one of my questions was, is there one place that the residents can go to get information that overlaps our various entities? And this storm water management issue tonight brought that up again. I get questions from people all the time. Who's responsible for? And it's trails, parks, roads, whatever, but certainly the uh, stormwater is another one. It still seems to me that there ought to be, especially if we're getting a new uh, Metro District website, there ought to be some collaboration between entities to try and point towards information that affects all of us. And I don't know how to do that, but once again, I would like to see if there is a way to make that happen. Thank you. Um, the one thing that, I'll go last, but May I have an update on um, the last meeting that we had? We had several concerned citizens here with an issue um, regarding zoning that was outside of our jurisdiction, but can anyone provide me an update? I can. Um, so the Planning Commission, the Douglas County Planning Commission met last Monday night? Thursday night? Monday. When was it? Monday. Monday night, yeah, from last Monday night a week ago. Um, there were a, a lot of Castle Pines residents there, mostly Forest Park. Reese and I were there, um, and Sam was there. Sam spoke, uh, we presented a letter, that I think you all have seen the letter. Sam spoke, basically presenting the letter in public. Um, Reese and I both spoke as well in support. You've not seen the letter? We'll get it to you. It was a short time frame to turn around that letter and get it out. So we just had uh, the, the uh, board or two people take a quick look at it and we got it out. So our, my apologies, but time frame. So we'll get it to you. So my apologies. Uh, we reviewed it. They asked us to review it. Yeah. The director was for us to review it. I just said, I, now that I think about it, I actually don't think I ever saw the final draft, the final letter. Makes sense. So anyway, the letter was given. Sam presented the letter. Reese and I both spoke. Um, ultimately, the um, the planning commission path uh, recommended the changes, re recommended the zoning change to the board of county commissioners. Um, there were a few changes made to what the zoning was. Most of the residents of Forest Park weren't happy with them. Um, but as part of the recommendation of the Board of County Commissioners, they also directed staff to look at some things such as setbacks, noise limits, traffic, and safety um, prior to it getting to the Board of County Commissioners meeting on the 14th. So um, the point being that, um, that it, it had, the zoning changes passed. Um, there may be some changes to those zoning changes going forward. Um, what most people wanted were to have some criteria built in around uh, the USR process. And it sounds like to me that they're going to be fairly, they're going to be more subjective than objective. And so um, the Castle Cliff Estate will be able to apply for USR because there won't be any, I don't think there's going to be criteria that would prevent her from applying for USR. Um, of course, the question is going to be whether commissioners were granted. So what's our next step? Um, I think we've kind of done what we should do, which is um, present a letter to the Planning Commission. I guess we could um, 
revisit the letter and see if we want to give it to the uh, commissioners, the Board of County Commissioners, but it's in the packet that's going to go to the Board of County Commissioners. So to a large extent, we've, we've lodged our concerns and, and addressed the issue with regard to the zoning amendment. So I, I would recommend that we not um, do anything else at this point. Um, you know, like we said, we've had, we've had that. Um, and so I think that at this point, we've, we've kind of done what we should do. You know, as the county commissioners look at this zoning amendment, they're looking at it as a countywide issue. And is there going to be a greater benefit for the whole than it will be for an individual? The chances are, in my opinion, the answer to that is yes. Specifically, I believe that if the county commissioners do pass that zoning amendment, that's when Catherine's USR comes into play. And I believe that is probably where the city's best interest lies, and that is supporting our Forest Park residents in objections to any use by special review that's done by Castle Cliff. To me, that's where I think the fight is, not anymore at that zoning level. In the follow-up, I, I think this is about the, the Board of County Commissioners. There's a planning commission, you have other commissioners, so you have to say the whole thing. Um, but I think the Board of County Commissioners is going to pass this, so I don't think we're really going to make any a, a large impact on them at the end of the day. Um, and so I, I do think that the we certainly need to get involved when the Castle Cliff USR comes up. Um, and that's going to be down the line. I know that they, she filed an application because the Douglas County policy is to allow applications for proposed changes to zoning. So you're allowed to apply even while the zoning change is pending for whatever it is. Um, the, the county planning office sent her back a, uh, a letter saying, a several page letter saying, didn't do this, this, and this. Um, my understanding is she has now resubmitted that document. Um, I have not had a chance to review it. Um, I, I'm hearing rumblings that it's still going to probably need more work and that she hasn't done nearly what she needs to do. So I have a feeling this is this is going to be a long process. I don't I don't know when she's going to get the full application in or when they're even going to start hearing. It. I guess my question is then, is this something that we get notified of, or how do we stay on top of the process so that we're not surprised? We will be notified uh, during the comment period for the USR, and when we get that, we will certainly be responding uh, within the uh, several week uh, comment period window that we have. And, and um, so when the, when the new USR uh, response came in, um, Sam got a copy of it because he's on the notification list. Um, we communicated, he communicated with, or maybe Risa communicated to him with, um, I can't remember the woman's name, who runs the Master Association. So there's coordination going on. So we, we will know, um, even though we're supposed to get it, for some reason we don't, I'm sure we'll hear about it from the Master or from the Forest Park folks. Thank you very much. And with that, have I overlooked any other agenda items that anyone would like to address? And are there any other questions, comments? If not, may I get a motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye.